It's great to be with you this morning. I've been to Cookville several times. Uh, you might recognize my last name, McDaniel. Uh, my Uncle Glenn preached for many years down the road at Jefferson Avenue. I've been with my father as he preached gospel meetings there and in the area. And so I know this town, but it is great to be with you at College Side this morning. Uh, Joe and I got to know each other, and I, I think, I hope it wasn't just a friendly gesture that at the end of the conference he said, that was a great job, and anytime you're in Cookville, my pulpit is yours, because sometimes that's just a friendly comment. But what he didn't know is I said, October 14th. <laughs> but it's been great to get to know him. It was great to be down in Orlando, and we have enjoyed being in Tennessee uh, this past week for some other things that I'll tell you more about here in a little while. I believe that each and every one of us has the right and the God-given opportunity to choose to be happy, to choose to live a positive lifestyle, and in living that lifestyle, draw as many people to Jesus as possible. You can see in the video that I live what I term to be an awesome life. Joe mentioned I have a family. I love getting to travel with them. Uh, we've been on this trip since Monday, October 1st with several other engagements. This is the last one, and it is time to be home. So we're hitting the road here in a little while, but I have gotten to travel with them on this trip, and that's been a blast. I drive a car with my feet. I run two businesses from home. One is going around speaking like this. The other is a Disney specialist travel agency, which is why I was so excited when he said Orlando, Florida. I live the life I want to live, and more importantly, I live the life that I think God wants me to live, because it's in my choice, and it's what he gave me, to live for Him. My parents would tell you that it wasn't always easy. In 1980, when I was born, they didn't do sonograms on a routine basis. So my parents had no idea that I was going to be born any differently than my brother or my sister. And after the shock of a birth of a child with no arms, they fell into despair. What do you do with a child without arms? What do you do with a child with a disability? How would we raise that child? They eventually decided that they had to give up on a dream. They had dreamed of a perfect child just as every parent does. And once they gave up on that dream, they realized that they would take it one day at a time. My dad remembers one time when he was in the pits of despair and, and, and really struggling. He said it was the minute details it was the things that maybe weren't the grand plans. It was the little things in life that I wouldn't be able to do. At the time, Terry Bradshaw was all the rage. I lived in Bossier City, Louisiana. So Terry Bradshaw was the king. He still thinks he's the king now, but he was the king back then. And my dad remembers thinking, my son will never throw the football like Terry Bradshaw. He'll never be able to throw the football like that. And he was mulling over this until another thought came into his head. My older brother can't throw the football like Terry Bradshaw. <laughs> they soon realized that I needed the Lord and I needed their care and that we would take it one day at a time. And I remember from very early on my parents telling me, you're no different than anyone else. You may look different, but you aren't different. Your dreams are your dreams, your goals are your goals, and as long as you're a child of God's, that's all we want for you. So they kept telling me over and over again, you're no different than anybody else. You can do anything you want. And this got them into trouble because I believed them. <laughs> Doctors told my parents I would never walk. Uh, just to give you an idea, I don't have a femur bone in either leg. The bone that I do have is the tibia. I do not have a fibula either. And the tibia dead ends before it gets to my pelvic joint. So as I stand before you, I'm standing on muscle mass alone. There is no bone structure supporting my body right now. The moment I stepped up those stairs, my body told me to sit back down because it's in pain. But I do this to prove a point. So doctors told my parents I would never walk, and I was able to walk, but it was taking me until about three years old to take my first steps. And you know, if you have had a three or four-year-old around you, I have a four-year-old now, they never stand still. They were always running and playing, and my friends were ahead of me, and I couldn't keep up with them. So my parents decided that the best way to solve this problem was to buy me my first powered wheelchair. Now let me give you a mental image. That wheelchair weighed 400 pounds. It could go 10 miles an hour or faster. And I was three years old. It wasn't dangerous at all, was it? Yeah. 
I remember one time, I grew up in the church since my dad was a preacher, and I remember one time playing chase in the church hallways, because those are, that's a good place to play chase, right? I mean, that, that winds and curves, and you can take all kinds of turns. But I was the one being chased. And so I was running away, and I went to make a turn. But as I made the turn, I looked over my shoulder to see if I was still being chased. And what happens when you're driving a car and you're not watching where you're going? Yeah, I ran right through a sheetrock wall. You know those cartoon characters that want out of a room real fast, but there's no door, so they just leave a hole in the... There was a chet-shaped hole in the wall I ran through that day. When I was in sixth grade, my parents decided it was time to move from Bossier City, Louisiana to Dallas-Fort Worth. And we went and auditioned different schools because we wanted not only to have the school to have accessible physical plant, but also accessible attitudes. So we went around and looked at schools, and I finally chose one that I wanted to attend, and my parents chose a house in that school district. The key, though, to this story is the house was down the hill from the school. Now, the wheelchair I have with me today is, I, I kind of call it the Rolls Royce of wheelchairs. And in fact, when I get home, I'm actually getting a brand new one that the state has purchased for me. So I'm very excited to be home for that reason, too. But this wheelchair is customized for me. It does all the things I need it to do. It has safety features on it, all kinds of stuff. The first wheelchair that I had from three years old until seventh grade or so was the Pinto of wheelchairs. <laughs> Among some things on it that it shouldn't have and some things that it should have had and didn't have, it did not have resistance brakes. What I mean by that is when you're in your car and you're on your cruise control and you go down one of these sloping hills over here in Crossville or that area, at some point your cruise control is going to hold back on your car so that the state trooper at the bottom of the hill doesn't tag you going that fast. That first wheelchair, this wheelchair does have that, but that first one did not. The only way to make that first wheelchair stop was to hit a button on the side labeled brake. And you can guess how often a sixth grade boy hits the brakes. I didn't even know if that button worked or not. <laughs> so all was going fine. I could get my chair going pretty fast going down our uh, rolling meadows, our street, away from our school. And I enjoyed the independence going back and forth to school every day. So all was going well until one day a neighbor called my parents. He said, I don't mean to be a tattletale, which is baloney, right? Right? If you don't mean to be a tattletale, don't pick up the phone and become a tattletale. I don't mean to be a tattletale, but I was in my car and your son was in his wheelchair. And I just thought at his parents, you might want to know that I clocked him going 25 miles an hour. <laughs> my mom hit the roof. Did you know how dangerous that is? I can't believe you're going that fast. You know how moms are. She walked out of the room and my dad looked at me and goes, Awesome. I tell you those stories to tell you that I've had fun in life. I've enjoyed my life. I live it to the fullest, and I live it for God. I'm going to talk about three things this morning that I think we need to learn as Christians in order to have a better life here and a better life with God. See, I think Jesus calls us to a happy life. We read it just a moment ago in John chapter 10. If you can pull that slide back up for me. Look at the text in yellow. Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, I do think he's talking about eternal life there. I think that is what is being referenced. But I think it's also being referenced that there is an abundant life to be lived here on earth. Not an abundance of wealth, but an abundance of joy. Not an abundance of things or, or what the world would consider abundant, but an abundance of Christ. An abundance of realization that we are not under the law and that we are free in him. And that, I think, is the way we can approach life and draw as many people to Jesus as possible. You can go ahead and take that down. First thing we need to realize, and maybe one of the most important things we need to realize, is who God truly is. Because I'm fearful that in today's society, we assign a lot of blame to God where blame is not due. Hear me very plainly. I do not believe God caused me to be born without arms. I do not believe that there is a baby bank in heaven and that somehow some of his creation is created imperfectly. I believe that we live in a fallen world. I believe that everything was wonderful, that God walked with Adam and Eve according to the scriptures, and then mankind messed it up. We separated ourselves from God by sin. And it's not that God isn't sovereign, nor that he isn't God. But he gives us something called free choice, free will. 
And that free will allows some people to do evil. So evil entered the world. Was evil originally part of his creation? I think that his creation was perfect until we brought evil into the world through our sin. And see, that separation means bad things happen. And I think that's an important thing to realize, that God does not reach down and cause these bad things to occur. Because when we say things like, why is God doing this to me? What are we teaching the world? That we have a vindictive, childlike God who just reaches down at will and tweaks certain situations for the worse. He's not a God playing a video game, choosing who to kill or who to maim. He's a God of love. And I'm not talking about letting you walk through something to where you'll learn from it. I'm talking about tragedies that don't make any sense. This God is a God of love, a God of joy, a God of help. And we need to come to that realization because that's the first step in teaching the world who we worship. Look with me in James chapter 1. James sets this up very clearly. I believe starting in um, verse 10, I believe. Go ahead and pull it. Yeah, 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, gives birth to death. Verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Why would he say in verse 16, don't be deceived? This is a pretty easy answer. Because they were being deceived. They were fooled into thinking that bad was coming from God. He says, look, bad ultimately comes from this pathway over here. Our own evil desires, Satan, evil comes from a different direction than what good and perfect comes from. And that we can look to from above. After I was born, an acquaintance of my parents wrote them a letter and said, there's sin in your lives. And that's why you had a child born without arms. And if you don't get rid of that sin, something worse will happen. She had never read Job. Job suffered because he was good. He, she had also never read John chapter 9. Go on to the next slide for me. Jesus is walking down the road with his disciples. They see a man born blind. His disciples ask this ridiculous question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? I love Jesus' answer in the message. He says, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. I love every night getting to read a Bible story to my kiddos. And we recently read this chapter in Hannah's Bible. And then, of course, it's in her language. But I love the way they translated it there. As Jesus said, neither one of them did anything wrong. But because you're walking around with the Son of God, you're about to see something awesome. That's the idea, isn't it? Bad things occur. We have to suffer through things in this world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But the next line is, I have overcome the world. In other words, when bad things come, we don't get to escape them just by being a Christian. But we get to go through them with God. And I'm here to tell you that when you get out of God's way in the middle of a tragedy, He can use it for things you never imagined before. I never wanted to speak. This was not my goal in life. When I got out of His way, He's opened doors not only to churches, to pregnancy centers, to corporations, but even to a government office where I was told to speak on where God is when we suffer in a government facility. I got out of his way and he used it for his glory. He didn't cause it. And I've even had some people suggest maybe he gave you this body so that you could draw a crowd. Do you know the football player Reggie Jackson? Reggie Jackson. Reggie White, thank you. I'm a Cowboys fan, so that was not a good word in my house. Reggie White. Reggie White, after he played 
his career, he went back and studied to be a minister. And he spent years in seminary. And when he came out, the reporter asked him, what's the one thing you learned in seminary that you, that you would say you want everybody to know? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, God doesn't need football. He said, every time I did something on the field, I thought that I had those skills so that when the camera zoomed in on me, I could run to the cameras, point to the sky like he did every time and say, it was all God. It's all him. Praise be to God. He said, I realized God doesn't need football. He's God. He doesn't need a man-made construct to get his name out there. Instead, we glorify him with whatever we have and realize that he's helping us through every situation that we go through. So we know who God is. What's the response to that? We serve him. We do everything we can in our situation without whining and complaining about what we don't have. A few years ago, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the Soul Winning Workshop. And there was a lady there. Uh, she had her adult son with her. He was born with some severe mental difficulties. He could say the word hello and he could say his own name. And that's all he was able to do at 40 years old. Now, I would term that to be a tough situation. Primarily because I've never dealt with anything like that before. But what his mother did with that situation made it far worse. Because she, she had spent her entire life, his entire life... From the moment he was born until, again, this is 40 years later, all day, on her knees, waiting, wishing, praying for a miracle. She wanted, and this is in her own words, in the snap of a finger, in a blink of an eye, for not only the medical problems to be gone, for the pressure in his brain to go down so that his brain could process what our brains can process, but everything he would have learned in school to be in his head, all of the friends he would have had, all of the experiences he would have had to just be there. And she used the word, I don't tend to. She wanted him to be normal. The problem with that is not that God can't do miracles. The problem with that is she had spent 40 years missing out on the joy that was her son. Because he had the biggest smile in the room of 6,000 people. You see, he didn't live in a world of war. He didn't live in a world of a broken home. He didn't live in the world of pain. He didn't live in a world of elections. (sighs) He lived in a world where he knew his parents' love, and God's love. And he never dropped his smile the whole time I watched him that evening. I fear too often that we approach our Christian lives the much in the way the world approaches their job and how they want to better themselves. What I mean by that is so often you hear, well, when I get a better job, then I'll have more time. Or, or when I get a better job, I'll have more money. Or maybe when the economy recovers, I'll be freer to do things up at church. Or maybe when I learn how to do this certain skill set, then I can serve. The problem with that is that God's waiting on you to serve right now, right here. And you've got exactly what you need to serve. I don't presume to know how God works. However... I do not believe I will ever miraculously be given arms. The reason for that is because I believe each and every one of us were put here on the earth for one purpose, and that's to glorify God. And if I needed arms to glorify God, he would have given them to me in the first place. In fact, there are some ways I can glorify him that you can't. So we learn to use what we have in the situation we're in. I'm not saying don't try to better yourselves. I'm not saying don't go to God and ask Him for things. He tells us to. He's our Father. But when He says, my grace is enough, you better be ready for that answer. You better be ready to keep going. Because I fear too often we have prayed, much like I have prayed in the past, Lord, if you will... Lord, if you will take this disease from me. Lord, if you will give me a better job. Lord, if you will give me a better home life. Lord, if you'll get me out of this situation. On any of those phrases, what's the next sentence that comes after that? Then I will. 
That's an ultimatum. And God doesn't need my ultimatum. He needs my service. And so we stop complaining. We stop whining. We stop waiting on things to get better. And we get up and serve the God of love. Finally, we love everyone. This one's the hardest point for me because it's kind of a direct impact. I fear that churches in America, not necessarily college side, not necessarily just the Church of Christ, but churches in America have come to the point where the members are the gatekeepers to Jesus. Where we have somehow gotten to this place where we have to approve whether someone gets to meet our Lord. And that approval is often based on race, socioeconomic status, the way they look, the way they smell, the way they talk, you name it. I was not far from here at another church in a couple of towns over about a year or two ago when a lady approached me in a wheelchair. She said, I've got a story to tell you. She said, I wasn't always in a wheelchair. I was able to walk around. I was able to conduct uh, an able-bodied life before a disease came and left me in this chair. And she said, while I was able to walk around, I, I, I worked with the youth. See, it was a very small congregation, and they didn't have a youth minister, so she was the one that took them to the lock-in. She was the one that took them to the area-wide gatherings. If there was something they wanted to do, she made sure they could get there, and she made sure they had supervision, because she wanted them to grow up in the same style of youth group that she had had when she was little. And then the disease came, and she was no longer able to work with them. And when it was discovered and announced that she was no longer ever going to be able to get out of the wheelchair, the elders of that congregation came to her and told her, you need to find a different place to worship. Because we don't want to take money from the budget to build a ramp for you outside the door. She was the preacher's wife. Todd Agnew sings a song that says... My Jesus wouldn't be allowed in my church because the blood on his feet would stain the carpet. God, forgive us when we've made this place and ourselves holier than Christ. Because everyone deserves Jesus. I love the way Jesus did ministry. I love the way that every time he did something, the leaders and the the rulers and the Pharisees would just get so mad at him. Because that's the way our churches need to be. That's the example they need to follow. Look with me in Luke chapter 19. Most of you in here, maybe all of you in here, know the story of Zacchaeus. This is one of my favorite stories. Read this story with me through the eyes of Zacchaeus and what an amazing thing Jesus did for him that day. It says, then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name Zacchaeus. He was the head tax man and quite rich. Let's flip that around. He was quite rich because he was the head tax man, as they still are. Anyway, so, he wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. Now, he was a short man and couldn't see over the crowd. Now, hang on just a second, because Zacchaeus already has three strikes against him, and we haven't even gotten through the first slide. He's short. I don't know if he's my height short or just not tall, but he's short, so he looks different. He is rich, which makes him a different socioeconomic class. He has a target painted on him. And third, and by far his worst strike against him, he works for the Roman government, which the Jews would have seen as a complete betrayal because the Romans were hated. Zacchaeus is not the guy you invited to the party. In fact, Zacchaeus is the guy that when he walks down the street, you kind of sidestep so that you don't even have to say hello. I always thought that Zacchaeus was just late to the party in this passage. You know I'm talking about, Joe. It's the people that can't ever get here on a Sunday morning on time for to save their lives. Right? Yes. I always thought Zacchaeus was just that guy. And I know the scripture doesn't say this, but give me a little leeway. Who would have been in the front row? The socialites, the Pharisees, the very people that would have hated Zacchaeus and hated him openly. 
Could it be possible that when they saw him coming, they bunched together to keep him from seeing Jesus? Of course, that doesn't deter Zacchaeus. Go on ahead for me. He runs up ahead, climbs up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus when he comes by. Jesus gets to the tree and says, Zacchaeus, which has got to be the first time Zacchaeus has ever heard his name said in a loving manner in public. Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. Go ahead and click that for me one time. Zacchaeus scrambles out of the tree. Do you kind of see him hitting every branch on the way down? The Son of God just spoke to him. He's delighted to take Jesus home. Now, when we've preached this or when we've taught it in Bible class, either we stop here or we skip ahead to where he repents, which is a great part, and I don't like leaving that out, but I want you to zero in on this passage, this verse. Everyone, not some people, not just the jerks in the crowd, everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have? Say it with me. Getting cozy with this crook. See, they couldn't see Zacchaeus the way Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Because when Jesus looked up in the tree and saw him, he saw a lost soul that needed him. And everybody else saw that jerk. And I contend that that's the way some of our churches have become. Imagine with me that in from the back door came about three to four teenagers dressed head to toe in what's commonly referred to as goth. That would be all black, maybe some piercings. It's an expression of their personality. And they walk right down the front and sit right on this second row where there's some empty chairs because they want to learn more about what's going on here at College Side. Is your first thought, and you don't have to raise your hand, but is your first thought, what are they doing here? Why are they here? They, they, they didn't dress up like the rest of us. They, 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 didn't, they didn't take the time to e- even take some of the piercings out that make me uncomfortable. Some of you parents, are you thinking, I sure hope they're not in my child's class. I go around and preach this all over the country. And yet only a few months ago at my church, I was sitting in the car in the parking lot before church started. And a guy drove up on his hog, on his motorcycle, head to toe, biker. I mean, if there was a movie made about a biker, this guy would have been cast, okay? He had everything you would have seen in a biker, He looked like he hadn't bathed in a while. Sorry if there are any bikers, but I'm going stereotypical here. So he looked like he hadn't bathed in a while, long scraggly beard, leather all the way down. And even though I go around and say this all over the country, my first thought was, what is he doing here? After the sermon, we had a special time of response where we sang some songs. There was some time to go forward and talk to some elders. Who was the first person down the aisle with tears in his eyes? God forgive me. Because that man who I thought shouldn't be there was just looking for Jesus. The love that Jesus has extends to everyone. And after being at a conference all week for crisis pregnancy centers in Nashville, let me tell you, That love extends to the unborn as well. I'll say this very briefly because it's a touchy topic, but the church has been quiet for too long. We cannot be Christians and believe in abortion. The two are mutually exclusive. There is no ground for that. The grace of Jesus extends to everyone, including those who made poor choices in their past and chose that. But you cannot, on an ongoing basis, Support that belief in our society because God's creation is not to be killed. It is to be loved. So we know who God is. We serve Him. We love Him. We love other people. And we do it with a smile. Because you see, I think there are two sides of the bed that you can choose to wake up on every morning. And it is a choice. It is a choice that if you don't make it, you will wind up where most of America wakes up. That is the negative side of the bed. Most of our country wakes up with a frown on their face. If you don't believe me, come to Dallas-Fort Worth and drive around for a little while. (laughs) 
I think the slogan is like drive friendly. No one pays attention to that in Dallas Fort Worth because they're all upset. They have no foundation of happiness. Everyone in here has a whiny friend. Every person in here. And when I said that, you, some of you pictured a whiny friend in your head. And if you didn't picture somebody, the person next to you pictured you. <laughs> whiny and Christian don't go together. Negative and Christian don't go together. Because no one in the history of mankind has ever walked up to someone with a bad attitude who was a Christian and said, what do you have in your life because I need more of that? Instead, the only side of the bed that you can choose to wake up on every morning is the positive side, is the side that puts a smile on your face, knows that God is in control, He loves you, He sent His Son, and that's all you need to be content, to be happy, to live for Jesus. You have everything you need to be God's child. Because I don't have arms. The world would say, well, you know, you drive a car. That's pretty cool. I don't have arms, that, but I have a couple of jobs and, and businesses, and, and they're decently successful. But the key for me is even though I don't have arms, the world sees me as imperfect, but through the blood of Jesus, God sees me perfect. And if I can live in a body with no arms and wear a smile, so can every person in this room. But you can't do it without Jesus. We're going to have just a moment here. We're going to stand up and sing. And if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't confessed him, if you haven't taken that step of baptism, this is the time to do it. I would not have survived this life and the cruelty of this world without Jesus by my side. And neither can you. But much more importantly than that, I cannot wait to be in heaven with God. And I can't wait to show the world each and every day of my life that we can have just a glimpse of that heaven here on earth just by acknowledging the love of Christ. If, there, if you need to take that step, if you need to be baptized, or if there's any way this church can help you, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.